Well, this Hope series has been, uh, has been really good, hasn't it, up to now? Who's enjoying the Hope series? Yeah, most of you. That's really good because we've had some great talks so far. And um, hope is so important, isn't it, in this world that we live in right now? There doesn't seem to be that much hope, does there, when you look on the face of it? So hope in the Lord Jesus Christ is what we have, isn't it? And I think that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Now, we've heard a lot about hope, uh, hope in God in this series, and Mark spoke on walking in hope a few weeks ago now. That was right at the beginning of the series. Um, and he talked about God's protection, his, our hope in his protection, and our hope in his mercy. And then Claire spoke about our hope in his provision. There you are, Claire. Um, and then Edward spoke about peace, didn't he? Hope in peace. And then Sally gave us a little bit of a new perspective, didn't she? Where God shakes us out of trouble and into hope. And if you've missed any of those, then can I recommend that you go to our YouTube channel, verso.church, just put it into the YouTube thing, and you can watch all of those again if you want to, or for the first time, well worth a visit. So what am I looking at today? Well, today's title is Hope is our salvation. So let's first have a look at the text, the anchor text for the series, which is in Romans 12:12, 12, 12. and uh, it'll come up on the screen, and I do have it here somewhere as well. If I can get the right page. I want to read from nine actually, and it's entitled "Love" in my Bible here. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good, be to, devoted to one another in bro, brotherly love, honour one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord, By be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And on the face of it, um, that's a very uplifting scripture, isn't it? But it's also quite challenging at the same time, isn't it? Joy can be found in hope, and we've heard a lot of that over the last few weeks and months. We've heard that joy can be found when we walk in hope. It can be found in his protection. It can be found in his mercy, his provision, and his peace. But patience in affliction? Hmm, not quite the same, is it? Almost the opposite in some ways, almost the other side of the coin. We have to be patient in our affliction. So we need to be joyful in our hope, but patient in our circumstances. When we think of hope in its basic form, we tend to think of, of hope as a way of just seeing life moving forward. It's, it's looking into the future, isn't it? So when we say, oh, I hope I get there when we go on a journey, particularly if we get on a plane, we don't want to crash, do we? We want to get to the other end. When we go for a new job, we hope that the interview goes well and perhaps they'll think that we're the right candidate for the job. When we go to the doctor, we want to hear that he says, oh, no, you're, you're fit and well, your bloods have come back, and everything's okay. And we hope that our children grow up well, don't we? We hope our careers go well, our family stay together, and that our health is, is kept well for the rest of our lives. That's what our hope is like as, as a basic level. And I think we share that with everybody that walks on the earth, don't we? We hope for many things, and much of the time, actually, our hopes come true. But hope has an enemy, and that enemy's name is fear. Hope's antithesis, perhaps, is fear. It's like hope has two sides. One that you can get behind because it brings everything good, but then the other side, the fear, brings everything bad, doesn't it? Fear, like hope, still looks into the future, except it gives you the possibilities of everything going wrong rather than everything going right. And without hope in God, we are easily susceptible to fear, aren't we? To an outcome that rather than hoping for good, we see what could possibly happen for bad. And I want to look at that this morning. 
Hope in a way is blind without God, isn't it? We think it's going to be okay, but there's nothing to say that it is, is there? But with God, let's have a look at Romans 28, 8, 28. Now we know, as Christians, that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him. Very, very similar, uh, familiar scripture, isn't it? For those who love him and have been called according to his, perfect, his purposes. But Trevor, I hear some of you say, you don't know my circumstances. It's easy to stand up here and talk about protection and peace and mercy and provision. But you're not living my life right now. And I can tell you that hope is in short supply. And I'm sure there's some of you that feel that way right now. I'm really up against it. Perhaps you are. Trouble's at your door. The future perhaps isn't as certain as you thought it was. It doesn't look very bright. But how can we have joy then in hope? Let me tell you, I hear you. Some of you are probably thinking, how do I get that joy? You don't know how I'm living right now. And I want you to hold on to that thought. But I'm going to tell you some stories now. Do you like a story? I like a story. Do you remember Max Bygraves? He'd go, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> you probably have to be over 50 to understand that. But, uh, and I am. <laughs> so stories. I've, got, I've actually got four stories. I've got plenty of time as well, so I can tell them to you. I've got four stories. They're short stories, and they all contain a bit of fear. And they all contain boats, interestingly enough. My first story is when I was a child, I think I was probably... Eight, nine, ten, maybe, and we were on holiday, and we went to um, Pembrokeshire. Anyone been to Pembrokeshire? It's in, in South Wales, that bit that sticks out the end there into the Atlantic Ocean, or is it the Irish Sea, one of those? And um, my mum and dad decided that they would take us on this boat trip, because this boat trip would um, go out into the bay, and you could go and see an island and pop into the cove of the island, and there were seals there. I thought, oh, that's exciting, I've never seen a seal. So all we get into this boat with a whole load of other families and some friends of ours. And this boat was, I don't know, 25 foot long, but it was just literally a wooden hull. There was no sort of wheelhouse or anything like that. The guy sat on the back with a, you know, an outboard motor, and off we go. And, and the seas were calm, you know, tiny little bit of waves, but not much. And we get about halfway there, and then the storm comes. And uh, everybody's looking at each other going, what's that? Look at those waves coming there. And then suddenly the waves went from, you know, maybe a couple of inches to a couple of feet to several metres high. And then the boat is like this, up and down. Now, I'm a nine-year-old or ten-year-old child, and this is the first time in my life where I have thought I could die here. Fear gripped me, you know? It's an interesting feeling. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling where you think, this could be the end. And fear really grips, doesn't it? And there's not much you can do about it. I looked at the skipper, I thought, he'll know, he'll know what he's doing, but his face wasn't smiling either. <laughs> oh no, we never made it to the seals. We had to turn back and uh, thank God, we made it back to the harbour. So that's story number one. This happened again, story number two. So I'm about 19 years old. I think I'd just become a Christian, and I went on holiday with a couple of friends. We went down to Padstow in Cornwall, and, uh, and we went, and we thought we might go on this pleasure, little pleasure cruise, again, out into the harbour, because, um, I don't know if you remember, this will date it, um, do you remember Richard Branson had um, a boat at the time called Virgin Atlantic? Anybody remember that? And he wanted to get across from Britain to America as quick as possible, so he built this boat, and it was harboured out in the water, is that harboured? Anchored out in the water, in the harbour, so that, uh, so we took the opportunity, I'd recently got a camera, and uh, I thought, I'll get some pictures, and out we go on this pleasure cruiser, and this pleasure cruiser was big, I mean, it was probably 60, 80 foot long, maybe longer, um, and you could probably get, I don't know, 150, 200 people on this, several levels on the deck, some people sat on the top, some in the middle, we sat outside, and off we go, and uh, the sea wasn't a mill pond, but it was pretty, it was pretty quiet. And then guess what happened? Mm. The storm came in again. And, uh, <laughs> and it came in so badly that, again, the skipper had to turn around. 
And the waves were, well, they were bigger than the ones before. They were enormous. And again, I was in fear. But this time, I had God on my side. And I remember my, my friends, I think one of them was a Christian, the other one wasn't. And we were looking at each other going, this looks pretty bad, doesn't it? And the boat's like, ooh, up and down like this. And, you know, nearly touching the water on either side. And, and the skipper's on the thing, rah, 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 like this. And, uh, and then the guy decides, instead of doing this over the waves, he's going to turn it sideways on. And then you can imagine the boat was going, ooh. And I thought, that's it. This is, this is the end. And then I heard a little voice in my head go, trust the skipper. He knows what he's doing. And he did. And he got us back to shore. And so that's, that's story number two. Story number three. This is a bit more recent. Um, Maria and I uh, were invited to go on a canal boat. No chances of waves <laughs> on a canal boat. Nice four miles an hour, fairly steady. Not, you don't even get choppiness on a canal boat. Anyone been on a canal boat? I've been on a few times. It was friends of Maria worked with this, this lady. She was a colleague. So her and her husband said, oh, we've got this brand new boat just been built. Would you like to come out for a trip at one weekend? I think it was a Saturday or something. So we go on this boat, and, um, and the guy says to me, would you like to drive a bit, you know, get on the back on the tiller? So I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I'll do that. So I, off we go. And then he come to a lock, and I said, do you want to take over? He said, no, 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 you, you take it in. You take it in. No problem. So he goes out, gets off the boat. I potter into the thing. And, of course, one thing you're not supposed to do when you get into a lock, we were going downhill as well, which didn't help, um, was you mustn't back the boat up into a thing called the sill as the back of the boat gets caught on the sill. Now, I was worried about this brand new boat getting scratched on the gates at the front of the lock. So I'm backing off as he's letting the water out, and, um, and then I catch the very edge of the boat on the sill. And I'm like, oh no, so I'm just wiggling the tiller to try and get it off, and it just wouldn't move. So then I realize I'm, we're in trouble, and the boat starts to tilt like this. So I shout, Nick, I'm on the sill. And Nick, who's right down the other end of the thing, just, he literally just opened all the, all the lock gates and all the water was coming out. So he said, without even, you know, worrying, oh, it's okay, I'll sort that out. So he closes the gates very slowly, walks across the thing, closes the other one, and at this moment, the, the boat's getting tilted and tilted, and then I hear the crockery smashing inside the boat. <laughs> And the lady of the boat screaming at the top of her voice in abject fear. She's in there with her three-year-old, and I'm sitting on the back not knowing what to do, helpless, not knowing what to do, realising that I've only just met this guy and I'm about to drown his wife and three-year-old <laughs> child. But the, that sense of fear, it gripped me and it gripped her. Particularly, she'd been through this situation once before, and she thought, oh, no, it's all happening again. And that sense of fear is not, there's really, at that time, there's not much you can do about it, is there? I felt hopeless. Now, this guy was calm as a cucumber, got, did those gates, went back, put the water back in, all okay. So, that was story number three. So, what is the moral of those stories? Well, firstly, that fear can grip us all of a sudden, it comes out of the blue and it gets you, doesn't it? Sort of that, ceiling, that feeling of sinking. So that's the first moral. The second is, don't get in a boat with Trevor. <laughs> well, not if he's driving it anyway. <laughs> but I want to tell you another story, and this one comes from, from the good book. This is from Matthew 8 and starting at 23. Hopefully, it will come up on the screen if you've got it, the devices or your Bible. You'll better read along with me. I'm reading from the NIV. So just a bit of context of this. Jesus, just a few pages before, has been up the mountain help, uh, talking to people and doing the Beatitudes, and then he's done a few miracles, man with leprosy, the centurion. Remember that centurion where he comes to him and says, heal my servant. That's all happened. And... Jesus is tired, and he says to his disciples, come on. And he said, and it starts at verse 18. 
When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross over to the other side of the lake. No, I'm sorry, I'm too far ahead. 23 is down here. Then he got into a boat and his disciples followed him. And without warning, a furious storm, recognize the story, came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, this is quite a short and concise story, isn't it? And I think there's more to this than meets the eyes. And I think you're going to have to give me some license for a, a little poetic bit around the edge of the story. So I want to dig a bit deeper. Now, interestingly enough, if you see at the beginning, Jesus initiated this trip. It wasn't the disciples said, quick, let's get him in a boat and off across the other side of the lake. Jesus said, no, let's get in the boat. And when Jesus did something, there was always a reason, wasn't there? It wasn't just, oh, I fancy a trip on a boat. Don't go with me. But um, there's always a point of learning, isn't there? And so what are we learning? Let's think about that as we just go through the story. So the furious storm came. I know what that feels like, a furious storm. And the waves swept over the boat, didn't they? Now, that doesn't mean that they were just going up and down. That meant it was really bad. Water's coming in, and I can imagine the guys trying to get it out as quickly as possible. And in fact, I know Mark spoke on Jonah last week, wasn't it? And when he was speaking, I was thinking, I'm doing a boat next week. <laughs> so suddenly, like before, and in my stories, their circumstances had changed. They were in impending danger. But they were fishermen, weren't they? Well, four of them were. We know at least four of the disciples were fishermen. Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John. And some of the others we know. We know there was a tax collector, but we don't know what the other ones were. Maybe they were market traders. But at least four of them were fishermen. Now, I don't know about you, but fishermen aren't your sort of namby-pamby pencil-pushing types, you know, <laughs> that work in an office. Sorry if you work in an office. That's me as well. They were what they used to call in the past real men, tough men. You know, my, my brother-in-law used to say to me, my brother-in-law's a builder, so he's, he's worked with his hands all his life, and he used to say to me, oh, show me your hands, and I'd go there. He'd go, yeah, soft as a baby's bum, they are. <laughs> you haven't done a day's work in your life, have you? And I think you, if you looked at the fisherman's hands, you would have seen the same, hard skin, cuts and scars and bruises, because these were tough men. So if they were tough men, and this was a big storm, and they were in fear, which clearly they were from the story, boy, this must have been a big storm, wasn't it? I should imagine that they probably knew stories of people who died in storms. Most fishermen do. Um, there was a storm, you know, in uh, 1881 off the coast of Scotland, where... Loads of fishing boats capsized, and 189 men died in that. That's, that's amazing. That's one of the worst storms ever happened to Britain. We don't hear about it much these days. But I can imagine that uh, Simon Peter and James and John, you know, it mentions their dad, doesn't it, Zebedee, he would have told them stories of people who died in the storm. And I think they got to that point. Ooh, it's our turn today. The stories are much, much bigger than, than I think it appears on the, on the surface. So they look at each other and they thought, this could be the end of us. What do we do next? And then they look and they see in the bow of the boat, oh, there's Jesus asleep. What's he doing sleeping? We're, this, the, we're up and down, the waves are in, there's water everywhere, and he's asleep. But I don't actually think he may have been asleep. I think this was all part of the ruse. I think he had his head on the pillow like that, and every so often he'd just open an eye just to check how things were going. Yeah, I've got a friend who says, you know, um, you know, we have plenty of names for God, you know, Je Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Jireh. He has one that's Jehovah Sneaky. 
And I think, actually, it was Jehovah sneaky in the front of the boat. Wait, I told you, this was a learning point, wasn't it? It was a learning point. What were they learning? To trust him. So they were thinking first, well, he's a carpenter's son. What does he know about fishing? What does he know about sailing? Virtually nothing. Yeah. Or he was a preacher, a rabbi, a teacher. Is he going to help us with getting this boat out of this storm? Probably not. But then they thought again, didn't they? They thought, well, we've just seen him do miracles. We've just seen him heal the blind. We've just seen him just command healing into that centurion's servant from a distance. And it just happened. So they suddenly realized this guy was more than just their rabbi. He could command stuff. So they woke him up. Off they go and they wake him up. Jesus, Jesus. And they didn't say, oh, we, we thought we'd better just um, let you know that it's a bit choppy out here. No, they went over to him and what did they say? They said, Lord, wake up, save us. We're going to drown. They were gripped by fear. Fishermen who'd seen this again and again and again, they were gripped by fear, weren't they? And that's what our lives are like sometimes. We get gripped by fear. So they were at the end of themselves, weren't they? And Jesus said, and here's the learning point of this whole story. He said, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Hmm, interesting words. In other words, don't you know me by now? Have you not seen me? Can't you trust me for your life? And when we're in those circumstances, we need to learn to trust him for our lives because fear grips us, but we know that he is our savior. And then Jesus turns to the storm, and I like to think quite calmly, just like my friend who was at the end of the lot. And in a nonchalant way, he would re he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Go away, I've had enough now, calm down because he was in charge. When, asked, when Mark asked me to do uh, this talk a few weeks ago, I had a few dreams and sleepless nights and um, thinking about what hope means for us and how fear, as I've described it, uh, can grip us and take focus off his perfect peace and onto the, all the possible outcomes of the situation, as I mentioned earlier. Our circumstances get the better of us, don't they? And then as I was, and I was awake at four in the morning one night, God just gave me some pictures of people who are in circumstances that perhaps feel more like fear than they feel like hope. I believe that there's more than one of you here that's had a recent diagnosis of cancer. And we call it the big C, don't we? It's gotten to be a major focus in your life. Quite understandably, of course. But God wants to make that big C into a little C. Because he, your hope is in him. I believe there are some people here who are living with a degenerate and debilitating disease. And can't see a future. Can't see a hope. Nothing's going to change. The fear of that perhaps grips you at times. I think there are parents here who are struggling with their children's behavior and trying their best to navigate, nurturing and growing them, growing them well, but they've got a fear for their future. How's this going to work out? And somebody's lost their job, maybe more than one of you, and fear they won't be able to pay their bills and look after themselves or perhaps their family. Some are here in fear for their marriages. They can't see a resolution. They've said too much. It's gone too far. They stopped communicating, and they wonder whether there's any future at all. And to all of you that have these or other fears that take time and take hold, I want to say this. 
This is not what you were designed for. God intended that we live a life without fear and anxiety. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. All your ways, submit to him. That's the ways that don't look so good as well. Hmm? Oh, 1 Peter says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So what I'm saying to you, and please hear my heart in this, oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Don't you know that Jesus died for you? He died for your fears. He rose again and that, that you may have abundant life and all eternity with him. Just like the disciples in the boat, Jesus can come and in a moment, calm your storm. Take away all your fears and bring peace to your situation. Meaning that the circumstances don't change, but he will bring peace into those circumstances. When Paul said in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors, what he meant by that, and I, I struggled with this scripture for many years. More than conquerors, I'd like, just, I'd like to be a conqueror, really, you know, before I become more than a conqueror. But the truth is, he conquered death, didn't he? So we are more than that. We can take his eternal life. We are more than conquerors. I want to finish with just a picture that you're all very, very familiar with. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was taken, he was in fear, or as close to fear as you can get. Remember in the scriptures it said he sweated blood. I don't know about you, but I've never sweated blood, not in all my fear. But he knew what he was facing. He knew what was coming. What was coming was the most abject cruelty in the shape of the cross. The Romans crucified people because it was the worst form of torture there is. And he knew he was facing that. But he said to God, didn't he, not my will, but yours. So he was prepared to face it for you and me. And when he was arrested the next evening, he didn't struggle to, well, no, I think it's the same evening. He didn't struggle to get out the arrest. He could have done, couldn't he? He went willingly with the soldiers because he knew his destiny. And when he stood before Pilate, he said virtually nothing, didn't he, to defend himself, because his fate was already set. Not by them, but by his father. And when they put the crown of thorns upon his head, he could have just taken it off and removed it, but he took the pain, didn't he, for us. And when they whipped his back, with the cat of nine tails, which is a whip made of nine lengths of string that are woven with sharp pieces of flint so that when you whip, it rips through in stripes upon your back. He could have stopped them, couldn't he? He had all the power in the world, all the authority to say, no, it stops here. But he didn't. And when they spat in his face, and punched him with their fists and ridiculed him and said to him, come on, prophesy. He said nothing. And when he carried the cross up the hill to Golgotha, he could have easily asked for help from a host of angels, but he didn't. He took the weight of that cross until it was heavy, too heavy for his frail body. And when he finally lay on the cross. He didn't struggle and try and break away, did he? No. He stretched out his hand and he took our sin as the soldiers nailed through his hand and into the cross. And then he put out his other hand and they nailed all our fears and all our anxieties 
into him as well. And then finally, they put a third nail through his legs so that he could stand no more and finish the job. All without complaint. All in total humility. All that we may live and know the mercy of God in our lives. Brothers and sisters, hope is our salvation because hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And Isaiah puts it better than me. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Hallelujah. You all know the story, he died for us all. But then on the third day, he rose again. Hallelujah. And he gave us eternal life, didn't he? Fear has been defeated, friends. The works of the enemy have no power over those who believe in him. And Paul says in Corinthians, doesn't he? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? We are more than conquerors before, because of what he did. So let's give him the glory, shall we? Let's give him the glory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus.